Good day, and welcome to another episode of Masonic Curators. We are still here, and this is going to be the last episode here in Warren, Rhode Island, at the Warren, Rhode Island Masonic Temple, home of Washington Lodge Number no. 3. The building was built in 1798. The doors were opened to the membership in 1799. Now, in the first episode that I talked about this building and the banners, I mentioned when you come to this building, and hopefully you all will at some point in time to see such a historical place like this, to leave two things outside when you come into the front door. And that's your cardboard box that we are so safely tucked in as masons, uh, and your horse blinders. Uh, I'm joined here with the historian of Washington Lodge Number no. Three, Steve, who's going to worship for Steve, who's going to talk a little bit about the building in more depth. But the other thing too is when you come here, remember, leave the box outside, leave the blinders outside. When you come in here, come in here with a fresh scent of sight and smell. As I mentioned, when I came into this building, I could just smell the history. It's a musty smell, as you do in a lot of old buildings. But that's history. That's just not just must. That's history. And you got to think about it, too. There was no kitchen for this building when it was built. There is an addition that was added on to later that hopefully Steve will talk about. The other thing, too, is when you come to a building like this, think about it. Okay, I've been to a lot of historical homes in my time. There were no bathrooms. Remember, when the brethren came here in 1799 and they had to do a number one or a number two, okay, they went outside. It's called an outhouse. Imagine that. An outhouse. A large building that's still used today that had an outhouse. So with that, I'm going to ask Steve a couple of questions about this magnificent building. Now, as I had also mentioned in another video that 30 years ago, the brethren at Newport, Rhode Island, uh, I think it's Newport Lodge number 1N? St. John's number St. John's number 1N. Yeah. Uh, told me about this building. They just told me that the wood, the building is made from a ship. So that threw in all types of visions into my head. So... What is this thing about the building is made from a ship? Well, the story goes, and it's a little more than a story. We do have proof. Uh, the, when the brethren, when the lodge had expanded in membership to a point where they decided to build their own Masonic house, as they called it, uh, they actually purchased some land from uh, a brother who had owned the land that we are on now. Uh, he was a wealthy uh, shipbuilder who owned a wharf, actually just down the road here on the on the waterfront. And uh, the funding to actually build the building itself was fronted by more well-to-do members of the lodge. Now, the original founding members, most of whom were sea captains, they either owned their own ships or they were employed as a captain. Uh, we have members who are involved in the whale industry, whale trade, also with uh, shipping to China and bringing silks and spices back. And we also, unfortunately, have uh, members who were involved in the slave trade, uh, one of which a prominent wealthy member who actually owned his own slave ship. Uh, so that is actually going to come into uh, the story a little later on. But when the brethren decided to build their house and put up the money to build the temple, uh, they decided to try to cut as many corners as they could, but also maintaining structural integrity, as you would. Now, these gentlemen who would eventually begin the construction of this building were mostly shipwrights. So this town, the town of Warren, around this time had the ability to completely build a ship in about 45 days, which was lightning fast for a tall ship. So they, these men knew what they were doing. Now, at the end of the American Revolution, 
we have to take a little step back. The British occupied Newport for most of the revolution until they finally evacuated. The British, in an attempt to prevent the French, who were our allies at the time, from landing troops directly into Newport, had to create a barrier to prevent their ships from being able to sail into the harbor. So they actually scuttled their own fleet. And scuttling is a form of sinking your own ships. Now, the ships that they did sink were nine troop transports we just used for conveying troops all around the eastern seaboard, and also four frigates. A frigate was actually a warship that carried anywhere between 24 to 38 cannon. Four of these ships were sunk by the British with their cannons still aboard. So the British were terrified of the French landing and scuttled the ships quickly without taking the cannons. Now, after the revolution had ended, we entered into peace with Britain. The state of Rhode Island actually took possession of all remaining British musician, uh, munitions that were left within the state, former colony. These included the, what's called the Stone Fleet or the sunken ships in Newport Harbor. Being resourceful Yankee shipbuilders that our members were, they actually approached the state about purchasing some of the timbers from some of these ships. Now, it has been determined through underwater archaeology that there were three frigates that were found. One of them was missing. They could not find it. So it is believed that that was the ship that was largely cannibalized for the use of building this particular lodge, this particular building. Uh, and that ship's name was the HMS Juno. Now, we're not talking about the doors or the floor or the window trim. We're talking about structural. Absolutely. The, unfortunately, you can't see it, but the arches that form the vaulted ceiling of the lodge room are actually the rib cuts of the HMS Juno, which if you are familiar with a uh, ship, it, they're the supports that as the sides of the ship come in and go to meet towards the keel, those specially carved pieces of wood were actually purchased by us, put on top of the walls and inverted and used to create an arch. Interesting. Interesting. And the, uh, some of the floorboards are actually uh, deck planking from the uh, British frigate Juno. Um, that's one of the things that, uh, that I mentioned. Think out of the box. Um, I'm going to post a picture of me touching the floor downstairs. You know, I've been in museums, homes, and whatnot all of my life that are historical. <clears throat> I have never, ever in my life been able to touch a decking of a ship, a British frigate, from the Revolutionary War. And I was able to do that downstairs, put my hand on it. It's just, it's, it's amazing. What else can you tell me that's amazing about this building? What is it? Um, uh, going back to, uh, like I said before, that some of our members were involved in the slave trade. Uh, we do have records in our minutes that this building was partly built with slave labor. Mm that they used uh, the slave labor for like the bulwark, carrying the loads and things like that. But we do have an interesting notation in that particular minutes record saying that for their labor, the slaves were paid $1. Unfortunately, it doesn't go into any more depth than that. Were the slaves themselves actually paid $1 each? Were, was that the total that was paid to all of them? Were they all given a nickel? Or was that money given to their owners? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we don't know. Right. But that is within well, the minutes mm -hmm. of the actual building. Unfortunately, slavery did come, um, became legal in the New England area about the 1680s, 1690s. Uh, where I'm from, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, there were landowners there that had slaves as well. 
but slave practice up here basically fell out of favor around the revolutionary yes. period. Um, but of course it continued in other parts of the United States. Um, this is, except when I go to the shrine, uh, or maybe to a Grand Lodge building like Boston, do I ever see Egyptian motifs in a... I've seen Egyptian-style decorative work done, but no, nothing on this scale here. I mean, I feel like I'm up at John's place at Aleppo Shrine right now with the amount of Egyptian paintings that are on the wall. And these aren't, you know murals, uh, like a lot of the old Masonic temples had, uh, where they showed, you know, a mural of just one shot. These are full wall paintings. Yeah. Can you tell me anything about these guys? I these are fascinating. Very happy to. Uh, these uh, murals that you see here are uh, frescoes. So they were actually painted on wet plaster. Mm -hmm. And the original artist, his name was Max Mueller. And he was a member of Washington Lodge Number no. 3. He was actually uh, an immigrant from Germany who immigrated when he was just a child. He was about three or four years old. And he actually attended the Rhode Island School of Design. And this was before it was really a degreed college where you would go in for a set amount of time, study something, come out with a degree. It was basically just an art school. You went, you learned until you felt you learned enough and then you left. Uh, so he actually was commissioned in 1915 after this particular lodge room had seen about 120 years of continuous service uh, that the lodge room itself needed a redo, time for a remodel. So he was commissioned to come up with not only a theme, but also to do the work itself. So our brother Max went to the Boston Library and he obtained a copy of of what is known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead, also known to Egyptologists as the Book of Going Forth by Day. And this particular item was a complete Egyptian papyrus found in Egypt that it was roughly 80 feet long, one continual piece of papyrus. And it was basically a spell book that allowed this one man who had it commissioned, his name was Ani, he commissioned this scroll as his basically get out of jail free card. Because to the Egyptians, when you died, they believed that you had to face certain trials or gates that you had to pass through. And each god who was guarding this gate would ask you a question and you needed to know the answer to that question in order to move on. So this scroll was his cheat sheet. It gave him all the answers. And it was complete and it was intact. And you can actually see it now at the uh, British Museum, that it's in its own room. It, it's stunningly beautiful. The artwork is amazing. It looks like it was printed yesterday, and it was all done by hand. But this book, this scroll, the vignettes that were within it were printed into a book that is still in print today. And he actually went through and found images that he thought had a Masonic correlation to them and he took those images and he put them up on the wall in a way that it actually tells a story hmm. it tells the story of on one side of the room it actually tells the story of human construction of how humans began to build their structures and eventually what they ended up at so you have the earliest people in egypt building their huts or their houses out of mud bricks, which were just mud shaped like a brick, baked in the sun, and that was as hard as it got. But eventually over time and through human ingenuity, they started to work with stone. And not only did they work with stone, they actually organized themselves into stone guilds. So you had specialized workmen who would begin to work with stones and begin to use some of the tools that we as Freemasons and as also operative masons would recognize, like the plumb, the square, the level, the various other, the chisel, the mallet, uh, they would recognize all of these symbols if you were to show them then. But to them, it would just be working tools. Uh, so 
in a way, he's kind of telling the story of Egyptian slash human ingenuity by starting with mud bricks, working with stone, and then eventually building the greatest stone structure ever built, the Great Pyramids of Giza, which you see on the east wall behind us. Wow. Simply amazing. Now, some of you may know that our colonial brethren actually thought that Freemasonry did come from uh, the days of Egypt. Of course, we know, now know that it did not. But you will see a lot of early colonial period uh, Masonic items that with the uh, Egyptian theme, thinking that this is where it came from. And we've heard stories that certain pharaohs were buried with Masonic aprons on and so on and so forth. Whether or not that is totally true, do not know. Um, but Steve and I had a chance to talk earlier before we started filming uh, outside. Uh, this whole area is, is fascinating, especially I'm intrigued with the two buildings across the street, uh, especially with the hand-pulled uh, pumper engine that's inside the steam engine house. I believe that uh, dates from 1803. 1802. Yeah, 1802. Yep. Yep. Unbelievable. Uh, but we were talking about uh, the building itself. Not only are these murals being restored, um, but also the building has undergone restoration and is continuing to be rest in restoration because of its age. <clears throat> but you had told me a couple of special things, such as about the, the sandstone yes. that is on the foundation. Yep. Uh, that sandstone that actually forms our foundation uh, was quarried in Connecticut. Uh, where I'm not particularly sure, but I do know it came from a sandstone quarry in Connecticut. But it's uh, a fairly popular uh, working stone because it's, it's easy to work with and it's pretty. Uh, so a lot of the buildings that were built between the 1700s and really the early 1900s are usually made with this type of sandstone. Uh, there's several buildings up in Providence that are also utilizing this stone. Uh, the town hall here in Warren is actually built with sandstone from that very quarry. Um, and one of the things that we did not know is that sandstone is very particular to mortar and it can only be used with a certain type of mortar. Um, so this entire foundation actually had to be repointed because the mortar was actually dissolving the sandstone, uh, which we did not know. Uh, but that has been fixed since, uh, so it's got the right stuff on there. So it's really a restoration, literally from the ground to the ceiling. It is, everything is being worked on. And Worshipful Steve was also telling me about the, the roof and especially how the walls are. Now, if you come to the lodge room, you're going to see tension bars. Now, I've seen this in a number of buildings over the years. Um, and basically, they are there to keep the walls from, most cases, collapsing outward or collapsing inward. Uh, I've never seen them, in most cases, sticking outside of the building like I have here. But these are not original to the building. Uh, Steve was telling me these, are, these were done. To, but you were telling me about how the walls were made also like a ship because it was built by shipwrights. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about, I mean, you talked about the ribs, the flooring, the walls yes. of this building are built like a ship? It is very strange, and uh, you really have to see it in person to believe it. Uh, you can't really see it because of the carpet here, but there's actually like a hump right in the middle of this room underneath our yes, altar. I've already tripped over the hump. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, so there's a little bit of a hump here. And the walls, if you actually stand at one side of the room, so, for instance, our Masonic West Side, and you look to the east along the wall, you'll actually see that the columns are bent outwards. And it looks like the walls are starting to fall that way. But directly over my shoulder behind the secretary's desk is a door that has always been there. And that door is straight as an arrow. And it's actually in its door casing is actually triangular. 
So the door was put in straight in a crooked door and a crooked wall that was designed to do that. So when this room is full of people, when there's a lot of weight on this floor, that hump actually flattens out and it pushes the walls out a little bit. So like on a ship, it would actually add extra buoyancy. So when we have like grandmasters visitations, when there's a hundred plus people in this room, I'm always looking at the walls to see that they're straightening out. It's really neat. Interesting. Now, I've also noticed that uh, your door knock is, I, I presume, at least on the door on the right there, that's probably an original door lock that is on that. Yes. That looks very much to me like early 19th century. Those are both original doors with the original locks and the original irons. Uh, nothing on them has been changed, including the split top pediments that are above them. Uh, they are, unfortunately, you can't see this on camera, but hopefully we'll get you a picture. Uh, they are actually in a book on architecture because they are identical twins. And from what I understand, having a split top pediment at this particular time period was a very uh, flashy thing. Uh, because it wasn't easy to do. Uh, it was actually a very expensive thing. And we have two of them. Uh, and they're identical. Hmm. Side by side. And lastly, last thing. Uh, I also don't notice the door knockers. Yes. Uh, it may seem a little odd to us as modern Freemasons that our door knockers appear to be upside down. Whereas the compasses are on the bottom and the squares are on the top. Uh, this is from a time where there was really no agreed upon orientation of the square and compasses. So there was, you could have them up or down in any direction. So and for some reason, they opted for upside down compasses. If I may add to that, that sure. you can now maybe fully understand why they are like that. Um, of course, when Freemasonry started in this country, though we do as Freemasons believe that all religions are as such, and if a man believes in a supreme being of any religion, <clears throat> he may become a member. And many of our lodges have several holy books, not just the Bible, but many others that are on the altar. But in the early days of Freemasonry, here in this country here, Freemasonry was Christian. No ifs, ands, or buts, or buts, yep. buts about it. If you look at the upside down square and compasses, go across where the compasses meet the square, mm -hmm. go down, they form a perfect, square, a perfect cross. Christianity. Yeah. Now I see That's it. why you will see the upside down square and compasses on a lot of graves in that way. Now, I've also seen it in a building, a photograph of a upside down in somewhere in, in Europe, I'm not exactly sure, but that is one of the explanations, that if you do draw a line straight across <clears throat> in the upside down position and down, it forms a, a Christian cross. You learn something new every day. That's what I've been told. What else can you tell me before we wrap up and head our way? Um, I think I pretty much covered it. Uh, really. Oh, the oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm being told I have to talk about the the electrician's um, the people, not the electrician's hut. Uh, I would say the electrician's um, dungeon. Yeah, uh, that is above. I've only seen one of these above the large room, sort of. Uh, that you have to gain access by a ladder. And it has, it's a little tiny room, uh, probably no bigger than a closet with a little bench in it. And I presume it still has a real stat? Yes, it does. <laughs> a giant real stat. And I hope you don't use that no, real stat. We do not use the real stat. <laughs> uh, but you come into this large room and you see a big hole above the west. And I know what it's for. It's for a few reasons. And I'm hoping maybe Steve can enlighten me on maybe what it's exactly used for in this building. Yes. Well, uh, that is actually 
what we like to call the Tyler's peephole. Uh, because as I uh, mentioned before, the Tyler is an officer who is outside the door of the lodge. And our Tyler would be kind of doing double duty. He would not only be watching the door, but he would also be controlling the lights. So when we would be together doing Masonic ritual, in order to add that level of ambiance, mm -hmm. we would have the lights dim or raised depending on where we were in that particular ritual. So he would actually be able to watch what was going on within from without and still control the lighting. Excellent. Well, that answers that question. Thank you, Mike. And the chair. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, also, to go along with the Egyptian uh, fresco paintings, uh, there are a number of photographs of, of the large room in its early days. Uh, one particular that actually shows Egyptian style carpeting on the floor, but also the one, two, three, four, five, five chairs in the large room also have Egyptian motifs. As well as the altar. As well as, well as the altar. Yes. Uh, those were actually uh, put in in 1915 when the large room was undergoing its restoration and these beautiful murals were being put on. All of the older furniture, which was from the mid-1800s, was put downstairs, and this newer furniture was brought in. Uh, all of the furniture that you see around, including the, the benches along the sidelines, have little silver plaques on them uh, with dedications. Um, the new furniture, this particular furniture at the time, was actually paid for through donations of not only uh, members of the lodge who wanted a piece of furniture dedicated to maybe a friend within the lodge or the fraternity, uh, but also from family members of deceased Masons who wanted to have a piece of their relative's history live on. In fact, uh, our altar was solely paid for by a gentleman named Charles Cutler, uh, by his family. Uh, Charles Cutler was actually, uh, uh, went on to serve as Grand Master of the state of Rhode Island. And his portrait is actually hanging uh, outside in our portrait gallery. Uh, but all of the chairs are all dedicated to somebody. somebody. Well, I don't think there's anything else. Uh, oh, yes, I'm being point something's pointed again. Yes, Mike. Uh, tapestry. Oh, that we might have to do for another time because we have to probably go in to the room. Oh, you got a picture in there? Uh, we will have a photograph. We can't. Get the camera in there right now, but maybe Wish Wish Steve could talk about it. In one of the early episodes that I spoke uh, here in Warren, I talked quickly about banners. Uh, in their back room, they have a very nice, what looks like a homemade uh, glass cabinet. And unfortunately, the banner is inside. I'm not going to bother taking it out. And it's probably double-sided, but it is the large banner. And thus, it being Washington Lodge number three, who else would be in the portrait of the banner but George Washington himself, who was also a Freemason. Do you have any information about that banner? I do. Uh, that banner was uh, purchased by the lodge, uh, commissioned, I should say, uh, at about 1800, uh, when this lodge was really, when the building was actually constructed and we were really on our own, standing on two feet. Um, it's made out of silk. Um, and a beautiful gold leafing. Uh, we know that we actually have photographs of this lodge room with it hanging in the east. So, and that goes up to about 1914. So it would hang in the, the eastern corner of the lodge for about a hundred years or so. Uh, but the purpose behind it was in the very early days of the federal experiment, we'll call it, the United States, um, the Freemasons in their community would basically gather and march in procession, not only in funerals of deceased members, but also for building dedications. If they were dedicating a cornerstone or if there were a new school was opening, something to that effect, the local Masons would all gather and then they would march in procession to the place where they were, for instance, cemetery to the funeral 
and before them, they would carry their large standard, which would have been for us that portrait of George Washington. And it was, it's mounted on a crossbar, but there was also a T pole mm -hmm. on the back that you would actually be able to hold it up similar to uh, like a religious banner almost. And you would march with that at the head of your procession. Correct. And most of them were double sided. So you could see the group coming and you could see the group going. And many of them would have maybe the large seal in the front or the large name. And on the back, they would have some sort of beautiful scene done to them, a Masonic scene. Mm -hmm. I've seen some gorgeous scenes. Um, and while you talked about parades, maybe in some of your buildings, you may have come across um, a flat board with sort of like maybe uh, velvet material over it with straps. Uh, that's called a Bible board. Uh, it was used in some of the lodges and some of the buildings for certain reasons, but it was also used many times in the parades. Um, and an individual will wear that uh, contraption, which would be kind of heavy, pulling on his shoulders, because in front would be the open Bible yes. with the square encompasses. Uh, so with that, Worshipful, I thank you very much. Uh, it has been truly enlightening to me. Thank you for being uh, here. I've learned quite a few things. I will definitely be back. I am sorry to say it took me 30 F years to get here, uh, but I got here. Uh, I'm not sorry I took me 30 years. It, it, it's absolutely breathtaking. Thank so I uh, thank you and your lodge, the Worshipful Master, for this opportunity, and I think Masonic Curators would definitely do a return visit. Oh, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you.